set aside this holy day that we may remember our liberation and rest from our labors. Make this day a healing time for all that is for all that are weary and with for all that is weary and withered in us and in our bodily celebration manifest among us the life of Jesus the risen one who is with you and the Holy Spirit one God forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of Samuel. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. 
At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. And the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel, and he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli, and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son, lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew, because his sons are blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning, then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also, if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Lord, you have searched me out and known me. You trace my journeys and my resting places. And are acquainted with all my ways. Indeed, there is not a word on my lips. But you, O oh Lord, know it all together. You press upon me behind and before. And lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is so high that I cannot attain to it. For you yourself created my inmost parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. I will thank you because I am marvelously made. Your works are wonderful, and I know it well. My body was not hidden from you. While I was being made in secret and woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my limbs, yet unfinished in the womb. All of them were written in your book. How deep I find your thoughts, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I were to count them, they would be more in number than the sand. To count them all, my lifespan would need to be like yours. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Corinthians. We do not proclaim ourselves. We proclaim Jesus Christ as Lord and ourselves as your slaves for Jesus' sake. For it is God who said, let light shine out of darkness, who has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in clay jars so that it may be made clear that this 
extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, Percused, persecuted, but not for Satan, Satan, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so the life of Jesus may be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life is in you. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Last summer, I was volunteering on an archaeological dig in Jerusalem for about two weeks. The reason I say about two weeks is because something went terribly wrong. I had, um, I had gotten standby tickets because my brother-in-law works for American Airlines. And this is a great deal for me because I am thrifty and broke. But it also means that I didn't have an assigned seat on the plane. So if the plane is full, you have to wait for the next flight. To lower the chances of that happening, what I did was I decided to fly in and out of Israel on the Sabbath. See, clever, clever Gentile I am. Um, well, half the country doesn't fly on the Sabbath, so this is perfect, right? I'll have a guaranteed spot on the plane. And that actually did work out. I never got bumped because of the standby tickets, but something else happened. After two weeks, I was getting ready to leave. It's Saturday morning, trying to get to the airport, and I realize, to my shock, to my horror, there are no buses running. The entire national bus system is closed on the Sabbath. You cannot get from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. Um, so I had to wait until sundown to catch a bus from Jerusalem uh, to the airport a bus at sundown to catch my midnight flight. And also to my surprise, I did not know this, Jerusalem, the, the Israeli airport security is the most rigorous in the world. And they require that you get there three hours before your flight with no exceptions at all. So of course I show up at the airport waltzing in two hours and 45 minutes before my flight. And the security guard says, absolutely not. No, no way, no. Uh, you know. Would not let me through, it didn't matter what I said. Actually, the more I tried to protest it, the more he was getting suspicious of me, being bad or something, and so it wasn't working. I ended up stranded at the Tel Aviv airport for 24 hours, sleeping on a metal bench. It was not fun. And that was how I learned the lesson that not everyone in this world shares my lackadaisical attitude toward time. When they say three hours, they mean three hours. When God says no work on the Sabbath, that includes bus drivers. I tell this story because this is how I think most people read today's gospel. Jesus just wants everyone to relax, chill out, take things less seriously. Who cares about the law? while the Pharisees are the legalists who insist on the letter of the law. But I think that this way of reading the gospel is wrong. Jesus is not like me, stranded on an airport bench, annoyed because he thinks the rules don't apply to him. Something else is happening in this passage altogether. And so this morning we'll focus on three points in the text. First, what is the purpose of the law? Second, who is Jesus? And third, what is our authority to solve disputes in our time? Each of these questions are important for what it means to be a Christian and what it means to follow Jesus with our lives. May we look to his example and begin to see the world through his eyes. So first, what is the purpose of the law? When the disciples begin to pick the wheat, the Pharisees appear. They just like appear in a cornfield somewhere. They just pop out of nowhere. And they ask Jesus, why are they doing what is against the law on the Sabbath? They're referring to Exodus 34, where it says there's no grain harvesting allowed on the Sabbath. And it's interesting to think about what Jesus doesn't do. What he does not do is get into a fancy linguistic debate about, well, technically, uh, actually, the passage says this. I tried to cook up one of these and see what I could come up with. And um, this is what Jesus could have said but didn't say. He said, he, he could have said, well, the law says to rest from plowing and harvesting grain. And since we're not plowing and harvesting, we're just plowing, see, our actions are okay. Th this is kind of like, statutory interpretation that lawyers do? Well, Jesus is not doing this. His answer to the Pharisees' accusation is something completely different than that. He appears to agree with them about the letter of the law, and instead he goes on to 1 Samuel and tells a story about David. 
And he says this, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need of food? How he entered the house of God when Abiathar was high priest and ate the bread of the presence, which it is not lawful for any but the priests to eat. And he gave some to his companions. And this response from Jesus is strange in a couple more ways. Not only is it not a law passage when he's trying to answer a law accusation, it's a story, but also the story doesn't have anything to do with the Sabbath. It didn't happen on a Saturday. It's, it doesn't say that. Um, it also isn't people eating normal bread. It's about eating the show bread in the temple, which is just a different thing. So this is a somewhat strange choice of passage. So why does Jesus say this? What is the thing that's the same between this story and David and Jesus's situation? What, what, what's the connection he's making? And the common element is that his situation uh, and their situation both involve what we might call a humanitarian use of the law. When Jesus retells the story, he stresses that David's soldiers were desperate for food. They were in need of food. And likewise, as I'll explain in a second, Jesus' soldiers, his disciples, were desperate for food. Well, let me explain. Why are they soldiers? In Mark's gospel, Jesus appears, also essentially from nowhere. Mark likes to do this, just have characters pop up. And he gets baptized, and right away, one of the first things he does is he assembles 12 disciples together. And what these 12, what, the reason why there's 12 is because there's 12 tribes of Israel. And so by putting the disciples together, his, what he's saying is, we are going to reconstitute the nation of Israel in this group, and we are going to heal and cleanse the nation. And so they are homeless wanderers going from place to place, performing exorcisms, casting out demons. They are convinced that the world is ending, and so they are engaged in a holy war against evil spiritual forces that contaminate the nation. And they're going to cleanse Israel and heal the wounded among her to make her presentable to God when the final day comes. The disciples are soldiers in this holy war. And as soldiers do, they've got to eat between battles. With that context in mind, Jesus' soldiers, like David's soldiers, have a claim to necessity. They can't not eat. It is necessary. It has to happen. Um, and so Jesus and the Pharisees are not disagreeing about whether the law is irrelevant in general. This is a later Christian reading of the passage, but it's not what is happening. Jesus and the Pharisees are disagreeing about whether the present situation in particular was so desperate that there was no choice but to break the law. Um, this is also true in the second story, when Jesus heals the man's hand. He says, is it lawful to do good on the Sabbath or evil, to save a life or destroy it? And the assumption behind that question is that the situation is urgent. Unless, you know, otherwise he wouldn't imply it's evil not to heal the hand. He could just do it the next day. But as a traveling preacher who goes place to place to place, if he doesn't heal them that day, he's never going to come back to that person. So it is necessary to heal them on the Sabbath. And so what's happening in both these stories is the material humanitarian need is pressing and urgent and it has to be addressed. There's just no way around it. And that brings us to our second question. Who is Jesus? After he tells the story about David, uh, he says this, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the son of man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Uh, the first half of this is another way of putting the point before, that the law cannot contradict basic humanitarian needs. Jesus is, I think, pointing back to the creation story, the fact that humans were made on day six and the Sabbath is made on day seven. And so the Sabbath was made for humans, the humans that preexisted it by a day. And so it'd be wrong, then, to interpret the Sabbath laws in a way that causes human suffering. This is the same point as before. But then Jesus adds on another sentence. He says, and I think this is what makes everybody want to kill him. He says this, So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. And this, has, this puts two different things together into one sentence. 
The first is that he's the son of man. The son of man is this um, mysterious figure. If you go back later and you want to read it, it's in Daniel chapter 7. It's this humanoid-ish figure that sits at the right hand of God in heaven and is authorized to act on God's behalf on earth. So Jesus is saying that that's him. Hi, here I am, the son of man on earth. But then also, and shockingly, he says that he is Lord of the Sabbath. This is alluding to the fourth commandment where God says, I, the Lord, give you the Sabbath, Lord of the Sabbath. And Jesus is claiming then in this verse that he is both that human figure at God's right hand, God's divine agent, and also that he is God himself at the same time. And this is shocking. This, this you know, the son of man is enough of a stretch, but to claim that you are God, this is, this is blasphemy. What is happening in the Gospel of Mark is the disciples thought they were joining a movement like the one I described before. They would be demon hunters, wonder workers, and so on. Cool, fun things. Um, but the longer the mission goes on, the more cryptic hints Jesus drops that there's something else going on altogether, something that centers on Jesus and who he is and why he has come. In John's gospel, this is even more in your face. You can't miss it. Jesus will give a whole message about resurrection, and then he'll say, by the way, I am the resurrection. Or we'll talk about bread for 20 verses, and people think it's like a, a parable, and then he'll drop in, I am the bread of life. So he is centering his teachings on himself. This, also, this is also true in the other three gospels, just a little less in your face. But it's, it's happening here, and there's a dawning re realization among the disciples as Mark's gospel continues that this man is singular in his authority to control nature and that his vision for his movement centers on his own divinity and his own impending death. And for these reasons, Jesus is not just a good moral teacher. His moral teachings end up centering on himself, so it's more than just teaching morality lessons. He's also not just doing a miracle because most of the miracles are signs about his own self. And he's also not just a political organizer because the kingdom of God is centered on him. Instead, he is God in flesh walking among them, they realize. These two questions, what is the purpose of the law and who is Jesus, cut to the core of our Christian lives. Jesus lived a perfect life, died a sacrificial death, and rose from the dead for us and for our salvation. Who he is, is central to our faith, to our lives, as we try to imitate his life in our own lives. To the other point about the, the function of the law, we have to think about what's right and wrong, about what's immoral and what's moral, with the humanitarian aim of the law in mind. And in America, we already do this in one particular way, right? Like if you're about to be killed, you have the legal right to self-defense. You, you can break the law about killing someone because your life is about to be taken. So that's a, uh, right. But that's not really what I'm saying. That's a different thing. What I'm saying is this. People have basic human needs. Without those needs, their spiritual life will be different. We like to pretend that these are just two separate things, that it doesn't really matter how much money you have, blessed are the poor, whatever. Um, and that's true at a certain level. Like, once you have enough to get by, getting more money doesn't actually make you a happier person. But there's a certain minimum amount of material sustenance that people need. And if they don't have that, their situation becomes a barrier to their spiritual life. If you have to work two or three or four jobs to afford rent, it is inevitable that your spiritual life will just decline. Um, in America, church attendees are far more likely to be upper class, actually, surprisingly. But if you do studies asking people, how important is religion to you? You find out that the people who answer very likely or very important are actually the working class to an overwhelming extent. Why is that? Why are the people, well, it's because they have to work on Sundays, 
right? They, they, have to, they, don't, they don't have time to be able to attend church because their material situation cuts into their spiritual life. I guess I'm talking about what you might call a theology of class consciousness, that we cannot ignore the ways that people uh, and their class position ends up impacting their spiritual life, their ability to engage with God. When we help the poor, we are, yes, doing a good deed, that's true, but more than that, um, we're helping to remove barriers to people's life with God. Um, I'll make my third point more briefly. What is our authority for solving disputes? Two answers, scripture and Jesus, both from this passage. Uh, he quotes for Samuel, and he refers to his own identity as the Son of Man and as the Lord of the Sabbath, so scripture and Jesus. Um, and I'm saying this because there's an easy way to misread this passage, right, which is, oh, Jesus doesn't really care what the Bible said. He just does whatever and then makes up a story to defend it. Um, he just says, I'll do whatever I want, right? Um, and it does kind of look like that at first, but the more I think about that, the more wrong that is. His defense for his actions is built on a precedent from Scripture. It's just a different book of the Bible than people were expecting. He quotes from 1 Samuel, not Exodus. His defense is also built on his identity as a son of man. And from these two things, we get two ways that our disputes in our life as the church can be analyzed. And so if your view on something has nothing to do with God's word revealed in scripture or God's own triune life revealed in Christ, then unfortunately it will not hold much weight around these parts, and it shouldn't, because these are two of our sources of authority as Christians. This is a challenge because our daily lives are so abstracted from these sources of authority. Like, how do you answer what color carpet should we buy in the church using the Bible? I mean, you, like, um, it's also a challenge because we disagree about the Bible and theology, and so it doesn't really work to like resolve our ordinary disagreements using something that we also disagree on. But this is the task, this is the ongoing, one ongoing task of our lives as Christians, to seek to better understand our lives and our views according to scripture and Jesus and in time to better understand those as well. To conclude, in this passage we have a clear statement of who Jesus is, how he interprets the law to account for humanitarian need, and what criteria we can use to settle disputes in our own time. Jesus is not lazily breaking the law and then coming up with a rationalization for why it shouldn't apply to him. He is not like me on a metal bench, annoyed at others for my own mistake and rationalizing why the rules shouldn't apply to me. No. In this passage, Jesus takes an opportunity to make points that are far more important than that. And this becomes a teachable moment for him to explain further who he is, what he values, and how we can come to see others through his eyes. May we then be a transforming light within our parish and within our community so that others can come to know God and know that they are loved by God as well. All of this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We now profess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for us.
In freedom, God has created us and called us to work and rest in God's generous love. May our prayers on behalf of all creation be heard and we be empowered to share in God's healing and reconciling work. We pray for the whole church, especially Justin of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Paula, our bishop, Mike, our rector, the Anglican Church in Central America, their primate, bishops, faithful, and clergy, congregations in the Joliet Deanery, Grace New Lenox, Transfiguration Palace Park, Holy Family Park Forest, and Grace Pontiac, Com Pontiac, Companion Dioceses of Southeast Mexico and Rank South Sudan, St. Michael and All Angels Cancun, St. Andrew Watacona. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May God's dominion guide all rulers and authorities that they may know that extraordinary power belongs to God and does not come from human beings, that they may exercise their power in wisdom, compassion, and love, praying especially for all who are at war, who hold their own nations and people captive by violence and fear, who disregard law and right for lawlessness and rapacious pursuits. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May God's compassionate power be present to heal all who suffer throughout the world. Send healing for all who plead for relief from sickness or pain, violence, injustice, and war, especially those on our intercessory prayer list, listed in the intention books or in today's bulletin, and those we mention now. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. May God's light shine in our community and in our hearts, the light of the knowledge of God's glory in the face of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the light present in every person we encounter, especially remembering Lou DiMartelli, Blake Heiliger, and Patricia Lustad celebrating a birthday. Are there others? Any anniversaries? And all those graduating from elementary, middle, high school, college, or university, especially Rennie Devaney, Blake Heiliger, Mary Margaret Rogers, Sam Schroeder, and Kendall Williams. Are there others? God, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. In God's great mercy and forgiveness, may God's arms enfold Donald Coaster, Raymond Hill, Helen Totten, Sue Ray Snyder, Antonio Foster, and those we wish to remember now. God, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Let us now offer the prayer for the mission of our parish. Loving God, through your grace, guide us, the people of Calvary Episcopal Church, to joyfully carry out our mission of growing faith in your Son, Jesus Christ. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, that we may develop a living faith that deepens our understanding of you and strengthens our awareness of the needs of others. May we be a transforming light within our parish and within the community. All this we ask in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us now confess our sins against God and our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have asked. We have not loved you with our whole heart. 
We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. Thank you, Michelle. Michelle, so am I. <clears throat> Please be seated. I just wanted to uh, point out to embarrass him once more that uh, Ross finished submitting his uh, master's thesis this week. So, congratulations to. can get his revenge another time. Um, this coming Friday is uh, our parish outing to the uh, Cougars game at uh, Northwestern Medic, whatever it is now. Anyway, it's, at the, it's up there on uh, Kirk Road. And uh, so tickets are $9. So there's a sign-up sheet on the bulletin board outside of the kitchen. If you haven't already signed up and you'd like to go next Friday, please put your name there and uh, how many tickets you need and also what parking arrangement you want. Uh, there are two different prices for two different kinds of parking. Uh, there's a little glitch and the email in the the email address from Michelle Burkos uh, in the bulletin, but um, just give her a call. Also, we want to encourage people to please sign up to host coffee hour. Uh, <clears throat> particularly 1015 has been um, difficult to staff, so you're welcome to uh, make a donation if you would prefer to do that. Uh, to and through Michelle um, Burkos so that uh, you know we can take care of the coffee hour uh, or if you want to team up with somebody else to put it on that would be fine too but if we value having this time to uh, share together following the service uh, continuing our fellowship in Christ uh, we need a few more people to step up uh, and sponsor uh, the time, so please keep that in mind. Um, oh yeah, um, I was going to announce about VBS. So um, VBS signups are now open. Our theme this summer is the Magic Church Bus. Yes. Yes, we're not going to infringe on copyright and call it the Magic School Bus, but the Magic Church Bus. And um, the kids are going to go on a bus ride, metaf you know, metaphorically, with um, instead of Miss Frizzle, the teacher, it's Mother Frazzle, the priestess. Anyways, um, so it's an interactive um, musical and theater play thing that we'll be doing, and it's... Um, one, it's for two and a half hours, so 4.30 to 7, once a week for the whole month of July. So instead of doing the VBS all in one crammed week, we're spreading it out so that if people are on vacations and whatnot, they can only miss one of them or, and whatnot. So um, anyways, it's free with a suggested donation of $10 per child. So, um, but yeah, you can sign up and we're also gonna need volunteers um, I 
need to send out an email blast with a whole bunch of these details. So I will be communicating more about this, but just wanted to get the word out that VBS is coming up in now under a month. So that'll be very exciting. And it's Vacation Bible School, Michelle. Yep, yep. And I don't know if you said it, it's on Mondays. Right, Mondays in July. Yep. Okay. Any, anything else? Then I invite you to join together with me in the offertory prayer in the bulletin. God, giver of peace and true worship, make our thanksgiving today a fitting homage to your glory. And as we share in your table, unite us in your truth through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.
give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your word spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. the world, 
gathered at every altar of your church where your blessed body and blood are offered this day. I long to offer you praise and thanksgiving for creation and all the blessings of this life, for the redemption won for us by your life, death, and resurrection, for the means of grace and the hope of glory, and particularly for the blessings given me. I believe that you are truly present in the Holy Sacrament, and since I cannot at this time receive communion, I pray you to come into my heart. I unite myself with you and embrace you with all my heart, my soul, and my mind. Let nothing separate me from you. Let me serve you in this life until by your grace I come to your glorious kingdom and unending peace. Come, Lord Jesus, and dwell in my heart in the fullness of your strength. Be my wisdom and guide me in the right pathways. Conform my life and actions to the image of your holiness and in the power of your gracious might. Rule over every hostile power that threatens or disturbs the growth of your kingdom, who with the Father and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns, one God in glory everlasting. Amen. Amen. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you, and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving.
pray. God, provider of all good things, you nourish us with the sacrament of Christ's body and blood. Rule our lives by your Holy Spirit, that we may profess your name not in word alone, but in actions and truth, and so enter the kingdom of heaven through the same Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you forever. Jesus, I have promised to serve Thee to the end. Be Thou forever near me, my Master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if Thou art by my side nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my guide. Oh, let me hear thee speaking in accents clear and still above the storms of passion, the murmurs of self-will. Oh, speak to reassure me, to hasten or control. Oh, speak and make me listen, thou guardian of my soul. Oh, Jesus, thou hast Where thou art in glory, there shall thy servant be. And Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end. Oh, give me grace to follow my master. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.